let's talk about growing up. Um, this is technically the last week of grow up for now. Um, I've had several people tell me um, there needs to be a grow up too. And so maybe we'll do grow up too at some other point, um, maybe later on in the year, maybe the beginning of next year. Um, has this been beneficial for y'all? I mean, like, I, I was terrified that it was going to be too aggressive of a message like, oh my goodness, I don't want to, you know, I don't want anybody to like, I want to challenge you, but I don't want to crush you. It's just like when you're spanking your kids, you know what I'm talking about? You, when you discipline your children, you want to, you want to discipline hard enough to where it, they get the point, but not to the point where it breaks them. I'm not, not, I'm not just talking about spanking, but even when you, when you address them, like you yelling and screaming at your kids, kids can break their spirit. And so you have to be careful. You don't go too far. And in a lot of ways, it felt like kind of like a, um, some correction, if I can say it like that, within the body of Christ uh, with these different things. And I've even had two people, one this morning and another one at another point, said this one needs to become another book too. So a lot of times we take our sermon series and make books out of them. So we'll see how that goes because... I said to the other person, I said, well, why do you want that? And they said, because uh, somebody needs to hear this. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, like somebody needs to hear this or like somebody needs to hear this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you figure out how you want to handle that. But um, today we're going to talk about the path that God has you on. This is a big one. Um, and it's difficult. You know, um, when we're talking about growing up in specific areas, we're talking about more uh, than just growing up in terms of maturity, but in how we trust God. And the big problem with the path that we're on a lot of times is that the trust factor is difficult and we don't exactly really know um, what to do. I think the hardest part of the road is simply trusting God. Anybody else in here agree with that? I mean, do you find it super easy to just trust whatever God says and you're going to run with it? Now, that might be easy when he's like, don't go to Whataburger, go have a salad. Like, that's maybe one thing. But what if God says, sell everything you have and follow me? All right, see, now it's a whole different animal. Like, oh, oh, hold on a second. I know you had your heart set on, uh, just because I see the shirt, I'm going to say Texas A&M. I know you had your heart set on that, but I've got a better plan for you than that. But it's Texas A&M, Jesus. I, I, I. Okay, somebody said UT. I'm not even going to, that's a whole other division of the church we don't want to deal with right now. But, but here's the thing, if trusting God is one of the hardest parts about this, wait a minute, shouldn't it be the easiest part of this? Shouldn't this be easy? Psalm 37, 25, David says, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Now, I've struggled with that sometimes because I'm like, I've seen people begging for bread before, you know? Um, and here's something that is a grow up moment in the middle of that verse is, um, are they begging for bread because of God abandoning them and not providing or because of their own decisions? I can tell you right now in my own life, I'm not speaking over anybody else, but when I find myself in moments of extreme need, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's because I've made decisions that have gotten me to a place where God never called me to go. Okay, I've got to be very careful that I don't blame God for my own personal irresponsibility. Okay, and I think sometimes we do that. It's easy to do that because it's easier to blame than to take responsibility. Taking responsibility means, oh man, I've got to deal with what I did wrong in this, in this situation. Now, <laughs> we know that really easily, fellas, because get in a fight with your wife and tell me how that works out. All right, moving right along. Now, let me preface all this by saying, if you want to be on God's path, it requires you to be in God's family. Okay? You can't be godly by being good. But you can be good by being godly. We have a lot of people in this world right now that think goodness is going to get them to heaven. And in the words of somebody we all know, wrong. Okay? It's not. <laughs> being good won't get you to heaven. If being good could get you to heaven, why would we need Jesus? It's a simple truth. You need his righteousness. You need his blood applied to your life. So any, any way to try to get to heaven or to, to do this life thing and, and do it just because you're being good, I'm telling you right now, you're going to fail miserably. If you're expecting to reap the benefits of a relationship with God, which includes the path he has for you, but, uh, but not be in a relationship with him, I've got some really bad news for you. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. And this is going to happen is you're going to get frustrated because you'll go to church and you'll see other people reaping the benefits 
and wonder why you're not reaping the benefits. And then you'll get mad at them rather than taking some personal responsibility that you might not be doing the work that they're putting in to have that relationship with God. All right, let's grow up, y'all. I'm telling you, let's grow up. The benefits come with the membership. I'm really hoping today we can kind of bypass some of the basics here and, and simply tell you that if you're not in a relationship with Jesus, okay, then, then as a natural byproduct, you're on the wrong road. Now, that's a bold statement. I, I do realize that. Telling somebody straight up, hey, you're on the wrong road just because you're not in a relationship with Jesus. But there is a way that your creator designed you, and that way he designed you is to have a relationship with him. Okay, God didn't design you so he can use you to do this and use you to do that. That's a byproduct of being in a relationship with him. We get to be a part of moving the kingdom forward. The reason God created you is because he loves you and wants a relationship with you. In Deuteronomy last week, we, we talked about this. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord to observe all of his commandments, which I commanded you, then the Lord your God will dot, dot, dot. It, it requires your willingness to dive in, Okay. The benefit is the product of the relationship. And so you cannot expect the benefit without the relationship. That's the basics, guys. Um, but this process all also requires you to be able to hear God. And we talked about that last week, too. So if, if you want to hear God, you got to get closer to God. The closer you get to him, the clearer you can hear him. Okay? So how do you get closer? Yes, prayer. Yes, reading your Bible. Yeah, for sure. Surrounding yourself with godly people. Absolutely. But also creating spaces where God can speak to you and you can listen to him. I sometimes wonder if we're so much more focused on how little we're praying and reading that we've neglected the fact that sometimes we just need to be still and know he's God. Yeah. Interesting to me that be still and know I'm God does not, is not prefaced by as long as you've read and prayed enough. Some of us need to spend this week not reading and not praying. Come on, hear me out for just a second. But just sitting in his presence. And allow him to speak to you. So those are the basics, okay, when it comes to making sure you're on the right path. So, But there are three things that I want to highlight today that can help us as we grow up in taking these next steps. Amen? First one is this. It's just taking the step. Taking the step. Um, I, I, I immediately thought of Peter walking on water. And we see this in Matthew chapter 14. Uh, the Bible says, Peter had answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Now, don't forget, they just fed a whole multitude of people. They were crossing over. The big storm comes along. It's pretty wild. It's crazy. The waves are lapping against the boat. The storm's raging. And all of a sudden, they see this ghostly figure walking across the water. Now, you put yourself in that situation. I'm going to tell you right now, if it's middle of the daylight, and I'm out at Pops Lake fishing on my little boat, and I see somebody walking across the water, the trolling motor will be on level five getting back to the shore. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I might try to swim it. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I would be terrified. But now, in the middle of the storm, wind's raging, you're tired, you're exhausted, your mind's not working right, and then you see this ghostly apparition walking across the water. This is where Peter was in that moment. But there was a moment between the word come and Peter getting out of the boat where he had to make a decision. There's, there's nothing harder than taking the first step. If you don't believe me, like... Think about the last time you tried to lose some weight. Oh, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm not going to eat them rolls from Tuscan near a roadhouse. Like, come on, man. Taking the first step is hard. It's harder than overcoming sin or dealing with addiction or trusting again after you've been hurt. It's hard. Okay, let me prove it to you. You've been hurt by somebody. They betrayed you. Trust me. Take the first step and trust me. It's hard, isn't it? Because the first step, you're going to be thinking, are they going to do to me what the other person did to me? Some evidence might be in the fact that in AA, they tell you that the first step is recognizing you have a problem. The first step is so difficult that we, we don't even realize that we have an issue. It wasn't hard for Peter to get out of the boat. It was hard for Peter to trust that the water would hold. And that's the issue. What it meant was that Peter was going to have to trust Jesus for something that was impossible. And don't forget in that moment, we, it wasn't a perfect scenario, okay? Peter had to trust Jesus while still dealing with his own shock of seeing someone walk across the water for the first time in human history. 
Never happened before. The storm was raging. His heart was troubled. He'd just been terrified, thinking it was a ghost walking upon them. And then he had to process internally what his eyes were saying was true, but what his mind was saying, that cannot possibly be. You ever been there before? Have you ever been in the middle of your boat, in the middle of that ocean? The waters are raging, the storm is blowing, and all you want is Jesus to come help. And rather than him just appearing in the boat like you want him to, and standing at the helm and saying, peace be still like you want him to, he comes walking on the water terrifying you. Asking you to do something that's impossible. Has God ever said to do something, but you were so paralyzed by what was going on around you that you couldn't even process the situation, much less take a step? then if so, you're facing the same thing that Peter faced at that moment. And here's the question. Do you trust him enough to make sure the water holds when you step out of that boat? Most of you are willing to do what God tells you to do. I think you're willing to jump into that. I don't think you have a problem with that. I think you're worried about whether or not he's going to catch you if you do. I also think you're worried about if I do jump, was that the right thing? Because here's the problem. There are no takesies, backsies once you're in the air. Let me just tell you something else. I feel like the Holy Spirit saying to me, some of you have been so scared to jump that you've jumped, but you've done it with a parachute and you land at a place God never intended you to go and you don't know why you're there. It's because you didn't trust God. You trusted your safety mechanism. And now you're having to fight to get back to where God has you simply because you didn't trust him in the first place. Let's get real here. This is really the issue of taking the step. It isn't can he do it, it's will he do it. I can can fathom Jesus, God Almighty, walking on water, but can I walk on water? I can fathom him doing whatever the Father sent him to do, but can I? I can I can fathom praying, Jesus praying over people for healing, but can I? Like, you ever been afraid of that? Oh, I need my leg healed. Okay, well, let's pray. Lord, if it's your will. <laughs> you know, like we put it in his hands, don't we? Why don't we just, like with my own daughter, why don't I walk up to her and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed and have the faith to see it happen? Like, can I just be real with y'all? That's hard. Jesus can heal. The disciples had this same situation. He, Jesus sent them out two by two. It says, I want you to do all this stuff. Oh, yeah, by the way, heal people too. What? What are you talking about, dude? He said, you're not healing them, I am. How difficult was that, though? Can you imagine the first one? The 50th one, no problem. We're good to go, Jesus. The first one is the problem. Having the courage to step out. Some of y'all have businesses inside of you, and you're scared to death that it's going to fail. Some of you have reconciliation that needs to happen in your family, but you're scared to death to make that call because of what they might say. Some of you are scared to death of what it means to forgive yourself because you don't know what a life would look like if you weren't able to be hard on you for something that you did before. The first step is the hardest one. I can fathom Jesus being sent for a purpose, but am I? See, God has no respect of persons. He, he doesn't change. But, but if I step out in faith, Jesus, will you be there to catch me? It was never a matter of taking a step. It was just a matter of trusting the one who asked you to step in the first place. I just, I don't know, I feel like I need to take another little moment here and just tell some of you that you, some of you know that Jesus has asked you to do something. And it's difficult, and it's going to take a lot, and it's, going to, and it's going to change your whole life. And it could change it for the better, and it could change it for the worse, and you're terrified. But what you hear in the back of your mind is your dad telling you you're never going to mount to anything, and so you're refusing to take the step, or you're remembering how your mother abandoned you, so you're refusing to take the step. Some of you wasn't family. It was coaches. It was coaches that were so hard on you that you couldn't even process It was bosses that you worked for, people that took advantage of you, maybe even yourself. You hear your own voice in your own mind telling you you're never going to make it. Don't you dare take that step because we know how steps work out in our lives. 
want you to know something. You are bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. You are free from the curse. You are free from what your daddy said about you or what your mama did to you. You're free from what you tell yourself if you'll believe what he says about you. This is an opportunity right now for some of you, and it's huge, and you probably feel it burning in your chest right now. It's time to take a step. But I don't know if he's going to catch me. Take the step. Take the step. What steps you take? And preacher, I took a big step, man. We left everything that we loved in Longview and came down here. And let me tell you something. We do love here. Just because we love there doesn't mean we don't love here. We do. But I'm going to tell you right now, we stepped away from a pretty good setup and came to one that we didn't know was going to work. Do you know something? I look around this room right now. Let me take just one real quick. One, two. There are two families besides my own. Two families that are still here from when we launched. Two. Of the 60 people we launched with, only two remain. Two families remain. What does that mean? Does that mean we failed? <laughs> we probably failed at some point. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> we probably did some things wrong. But here's what it meant is that there was no guarantee that Freedom Church was going to work. Here's all I knew. All I knew is that God put something in my heart when I was 19 years old. And I've waited and waited and waited for it to come to fruition. And when I turned 40, it began to happen. It's hilarious that it's 40 because I told God when I was 19, I don't want to be 40 till I'm doing what you told me to do now. <laughs> so don't tell God what he is or ain't going to do. I'm just telling you that right now. There's a little life hack for you. But it just seems like all the puzzle pieces came together. And the path worked out. Even when we were told to sell our house in October because people don't buy houses in December. And I said to our realtor, like, well, what happens if it sells? He says, you got to figure out a place to live. It sold in, in three days. Full asking price. Oh, my gosh, now what do we do? Somebody in the church heard what was going on, and they let us live in a $400,000 house with a mini, like a baby grand piano in it for free for a month and a half. Listen to me, guys. Sometimes God will not give you what you're asking for until you're willing to step. Sometimes he won't give it to you until you step. Like, when it comes to this building, y'all, it's terrifying. 1.8 million on my name. That's terrifying. That's scary. So why are we just taking a step? Well, number one, because we feel like God said do it. But we feel like God said do it. And number two, because... In 25 years of being a pastor and of nearly 40 years of being a Christian, here's what I have learned. That if the path is the right one, God will have the provision waiting when you get there. I don't have it in my hand right now. I don't have it. That's right. Because if you had it, you wouldn't need him. If you had it, there'd be no faith built inside of you. I learned something in this whole process about hearing God that I didn't know about myself. I'm 43 years old. I didn't know for 43 years that this is one of the ways that God speaks to me. And it's a powerful one because as I look back at my life, I see moments where I had little faith, little faith, little faith. And it wasn't because I had little faith. It was because God would not allow my faith to grow in those moments because it was the wrong road. You can trust God can trust him. I'll tell you what you can't trust. You can't trust your own heart. It's fickle and evil and twisted. Listen to your heart, stupid. <laughs> but it's crying for you. No, it's not. It's, it's greedy. Yeah. And wants what the flesh wants. So what I listen to? I'm led by the Spirit. That's, that you, you're led by the Spirit. Well, how do I be led by the Spirit? We, we talked about this, but just to give you the recap, don't do something until you've asked the Holy Spirit to tell you, and then don't move until He tells you to move. Well, how do I know when He's told me? Listen, brother, that's between you and Jesus. I can help you in that, but I can't tell you when God speaks to you. I can help you. 
But this is why you need to grow and develop your own. You need to mature your relationship with God. You need to grow up when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. So what keeps you from taking the step? The easy one, guys, is sin. I mean, my goodness, sin will always separate. It always keeps you from trusting God. Sin will always keep you in a loop where you're always walking to the confessional booth rather than along your purpose. Listen, God, some of us, God is tired of us coming back and back and back with the same old sin. He wants you to overcome that sin because he's got so much more he wants to give you. Now, I'm not saying that God is looking at you going, oh, great, here comes Gwen again. Like, I'm not saying that, <laughs> which would be hilarious, but it's what it, is, it is what it is. But what I'm trying to say to you is simply this, that, that when, when you're in a sin loop of keep on, you keep on doing the same loop, what happens is your time with God becomes about groveling in forgiveness instead of him helping you with the purpose. So that's what I'm talking about. The second one is apathy. Uh, being apathetic will always keep you from taking a step. Apathy is, the word is apathos. It's without suffering. That's literally what the word means. Pathos is where we get the, the passion of the Christ. That's, that's what the word means. So most people would rather turn to stone than to enter into willful suffering. As water finds the path of least resistance, people will find the path of least suffering. But what if God's best for you is through the jungle that's going to cut you the deepest? We don't like to think that about God. Because God is supposed to be rainbows and butterflies and puppies and, you know, happies. He put Jesus on a cross. He told Abraham to sacrifice his promise. Come on, guys. Does that make him mean and evil? No, it it doesn't. It it doesn't. But it does mean that he would rather you reach your potential than you to sit and not have anything done. He would rather do he'd rather put you through some fire to get you to potential. Than anything. How many of you have ever done something and you had to work for it and it took a lot of effort, a lot of pain and guts and blood, and after it was over with, you were like, yes, this is worth it. It's worth it. Planning this church has been hard. It's been the hardest thing I've ever done professionally, and I've had the deepest cuts relationally that I've ever had in the last three years. I'd, I'd do it a million times over again. With the same people. Some of us are not experiencing God's best. Not because he isn't giving it. But because we're avoiding suffering at all costs. (laughs) How much do I have to suffer Jesus? Suffering is always in correlation to how tightly you're gripping that which is keeping you from stepping out. Read it again because it's a lot to process. Your suffering is always in correlation to how tightly you are gripping that which is keeping you from stepping out. God just cut my hand off. It's because you wouldn't let go and jump. See how quiet it is in here right now? Either you are processing, you're like, I don't know if I like the side of Jesus. The harder you grab onto what you're holding on to, the more it's going to hurt when it comes loose. And don't think for one second that God won't go to extremes to remove from your grasp that which is destroying you. On top of all this, if you don't care, why should God or anyone else care? God will do whatever it takes to get you to the moment of decision. But he cannot make you make the decision. Okay? So, if you don't care enough about where God wants to take you to do what needs to be done, then why should we expect God to? Now, does he care? Absolutely. But is he going to sit there and just beat you over the head until you do what he says to do? Even Romans 1 says that there's a moment where God just says, look, I'll be here if you want me. But until then, go and do whatever you want to do. Live the life that you want to live. I cannot be a part of that. The Bible teaches this. Have you ever tried to mentor someone who doesn't want to be mentored? Have you ever taught or coached someone that doesn't want to hear it? How do you react? Well, let's just, we're going to go at it again tomorrow. 
what keeps you from stepping. The last one is just distance. When you aren't close to the shepherd, you stop hearing his voice. And one day you're going to find yourself standing alone in a field wondering where in the world everybody went. It's because you just didn't stay close enough. Yeah, but God leaves the one that chased the 99. Yeah, he does, but he sure let the prodigal walk away. Don't count on getting chased down. Don't put Jesus in a place where he has to abandon his purpose to get you to your purpose. I wrote here, this is mean. <laughs> Grow up and take some responsibility for your life. <laughs> Like, seriously, guys, like, let's grow up and take responsibility for our lives. Amen. The three things spell sad, sin, apathy, and distance. It's sad when you won't take a step. It really is. Sorry for being corny, but I'm a dad. Dad jokes come with a plan. <laughs> let's overcome our fear. Let's overcome our doubt. Let's step. Okay? Now, that's easier said than done. I really get it. I tr- trust me, I get that. It's very easy. Oh, I'm just going to take a step. Yeah, that's easy. But no journey ever started without the first step. So don't be stood there waiting for God to push you into your next step. Amen? Because he probably won't do it. The next one is this, testing the steps. Testing the steps. Okay, so you took the step. Now what? How do you know it's the right step? Well, first, are you dead? It can't be that bad. Um, Was the step done with godly intentions? Um, I wrote this down. Um, Sinners fall back, but saints fall forward. I love that because we're all going to fall. If I fall, though, I want to fall forward into what God has for me, not backwards in fear, cowering down. Were you trying to honor God? If you were, then God can help, on, can help restore and help fix. Interesting enough, there are plenty of clues on how to step properly in the Bible, including how to take that very first step, right? How to keep stepping, how to test whether or not the steps are godly or not. So I want to read you some Bible verses And this is going to help, like, honestly, the Word does such a better job than me trying to explain it to you. So uh, here's Psalm uh, 37, 23. The steps of a man are established by the Lord. He delights in his way. So so God already has some steps in mind for you. And a telltale sign that you're on God's path is that you are delighting in the way that God has for you. Are, Are you delighting in the journey that you're walking right now? Now, does that mean that every little thing has to go your way? No, everybody calm down. Of course not. Not every single day is going to be just the the most awesome, best thing in the whole world. But in general, when you look at your life, are you happy where you are in your life? Are you delighting in in, in his way? Psalm 119, 133. Keep steady my steps according to your promise and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Well, what's what's his promise? It's written in the word. And don't forget that his written word always trumps his spoken word. What about this one? Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If you're confused on what to do or where to go, you need to find a Bible verse that will buttress what you believe God's telling you. You've got to do that. The word will not only shine enough light for your feet to see the next step, but God will bring a, a, a beam on your path to illuminate where, you want, where he wants you to go. I remember something that, that really Monique was kind of the, the, the push behind this, but we would always pray for what our next step was. We were adamant about not praying, God, show us the roadmap. Just give us the next step. Just give us the next step. Just give us the next step when it came to planting this church. God was faithful to show every single step. He didn't show me what was going to happen with COVID, though. He kind of left that out. (laughs) Thanks, bud. You know? (laughs) Proverbs 20, 24. Men's steps are from the Lord. Then how can a man understand his way? It's a powerful verse. It's a powerful promise here, too. The only way you're going to understand if your steps are true is if you're all in with Jesus. He knows the plan. He knows the path. He knows the steps. And you cannot comprehend them without Jesus. Now, this is hilarious to me because I instantly thought of a Rubik's Cube. Now, my family, for some reason, got real involved in Rubik's Cubes like a few months back. I guess it was Will started it. And Monique was able to solve them pretty quickly. I guess still, I, I should have had you come up here and solve a cube while I was talking about this. Um, but here's what's interesting about a Rubik's Cube. If you look at a Rubik's Cube, um, it looks like you're going backwards. And then all of a sudden, you just flip one flip, and then it's solved. Now, uh, your boy ain't a math boy. You know what I'm saying? So, like, the algorithm is, uh, it's, I don't even like saying the word algorithm. It just tastes dirty coming out of my mouth. You know what I'm saying? But, but, but she, uh, like her and Will, like, they just were able to do this, all this kind of stuff. And, 
And, and here's why. Because it, here's why this is hilarious. is because if it was up to us, we'd want to walk a straight line. Okay, God wants me there. There we go. That's it. It's simple, right? How many of you would want a crooked line? Come on, man. Like, give me, let's just get there. But listen to what God's plan is like. Up, down, left, right, circle, spin, circle back, jump, dive, duck, dip, dodge, hang on here, swim here, dive there, go into this pit and over this mountain, watch the briars, and then you're at your destination. Why does he do this? He's mean. No, it's because every pit has a promise. Every mountain has a moral. Every single one of them. Every obstacle makes an overcomer and every trial tests your tenacity. That's why. You think you need a straight path. What you need is God's path. I'm going backwards, God. You need God's path. I don't know how in the world you want to get me here to there. You need God's path. If you would stop trying to figure it out on your own for just 10 seconds and trust him, you might be further down the line than you expect. Isaiah 58 11, the Lord will guide you continually. The Bible says he'll lead us if we'll let him. 1 Peter 2, 21. For to, you, uh, uh, for to you this, excuse me, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered, leaving an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. You see, God put his money where his mouth was. I know those little WWJD bracelets are cute, but they're serious, man. What would Jesus do in your situation right now that you're facing? Well, he'd go cuss my boss out Monday because of what he said on me on Friday. Mm. He might flip a table, but he ain't going to cuss him out. You know what I'm saying? Don't flip tables at your office. It's not going to work. HR will be calling. Let me give you one more verse here. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Trust him with everything. If you can't trust him for your next step, how in the world are you trusting him for heaven? Explain that to me. Trust him for what you can't see, but not trust him for what you can see. Heaven's a whole lot bigger promise than the next step. So we first have to trust him with everything. Second part of that is don't lean on your own understanding. Now, this helps me when I can't figure it out, but it helps me more when I'm having a hard time trusting. God never asked me to solve the Rubik's Cube of life just to do the next step. Those stories are stupid. I hate them. But if I will trust the algorithm instead of what I'm seeing, I'll end up with a solved cube. And if you will just trust God instead of what you're looking at, you just might find your life is solved too. In all your ways, acknowledge him. One of the biggest reasons we get into trouble with our steps is because we treat God as a lifeline instead of a life coach. We are slow to ask for direction and quick to ask for relief. How about before you do something, you just take some time with the Lord? Take some time with Jesus. What if you ask God what to do before every step rather than asking God to save you after every step? And lastly, he will make your path straight. Um, You've heard it that way, but also direct your paths is another way it's written in the Bible. Um, And that word can mean straight or direct. There's another way, though. Um, It also could mean to, to make righteous. It's right to make it straight, smooth, or right. Now, think about that for a second. What if not only does God promise that he has a path for you and that he promises to straighten or direct them, but what if that path is a part of him working the righteousness of Christ into you? Well, that's a whole different way to look at it, isn't it? So what's the moral here? Test the step by the word and then follow the blueprint. Here's the last one. Staying in step. (laughs) It ain't always going to be peaches and cream, is it, y'all? It ain't always going to be biscuits and gravy. Remember Coach Brack when we played baseball in high school? If we got an easy, like a little easy hop, you know, easy ball to catch, oh, the boy getting biscuits and gravy. So he did say, old Coach Brack. But, you know, he he knew something that we need to think of right now is that he knew that life wasn't going to be always biscuits and gravy because the very next one he'd hit at us would be about 400 miles an hour. Life isn't always going to be easy, guys. If God didn't withhold the difficulty from his own son, why would he from you? Jesus prayed, remember, he says, if this cup can be taken away from me, please take it away. Paul was the same situation. 
I'm, I'm not going to read all of it, but if you look in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about the things that have happened to him over the course of his ministry. He's been whipped times without number. He faced death again and again. Five, okay, how many lashes did Jesus get? 39 lashes, right? 39 lashes. It ate his back to shreds. Paul, it says right here, 24, 24. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Five times. No wonder he had a thorn in his flesh. He didn't have any flesh on him anymore. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I've faced dangers in the cities, in the deserts, on the seas. I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all these churches. Who is weak without my feeling that weakness? Who is led astray with, and I don't burn with anger? If I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that, um, that show how weak I am. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is worthy of eternal praise, knows I'm not lying. When I was in Damascus, the governor under King Aretas kept guards at the city gates to catch me. I had to be lowered in a basket through a window to the city just to escape from him. Let me... Would you do that? Good Lord, we, we get upset if the air conditioner is not cold enough. Like, like I'm sorry, but can I, just, can I just vent for a second? And I'm venting on myself too. We are so fickle when it comes to suffering. We are so scared of suffering. Paul had his back laid open five times. And he was still writing. I've always made a joke that whenever I get to heaven, the first thing I'm going to do when I see Paul is I don't know if I'm going to hug him or punch him and say, hey, how come you couldn't write just a little bit more on some topics? It's a funny joke because he has some pretty difficult to understand things in there. But what if I just fell down and thanked him instead of griping about not having enough thinking that I at least have what he wrote? Probably written while his back was bleeding. And I'm griping about the AC. I'm telling you guys, we are so coddled in Western Christianity. It's insane. We've got to realize that this isn't supposed to be peaches and cream all the time. That God is not working to make our lives great. That we're working to glorify Him. He's not here for us. We're here for Him. I'm not being entertained by the Lord. I sometimes wonder if, if Paul were to write a letter to us, what he would say. Really, guys? Really? One person says something you don't like and you leave? You break covenant, you break relationship for one thing? Hold on a second. They're adjusting my bandages where my back is laid open. Give me a second. I'm not trying to be down. I'm not trying to... Look, I'm not trying to punch you here. I'm not trying to hurt you here. But I am saying this. Guys, we've got to grow up. We've got to grow up. If this series has taught me anything, it's not about how immature people are. It's about how immature I am. And my own issues and my own problems and my own immaturity. I've got to grow up. So what we need to do is we just need to grow up together. Can we do that? Can we grow up together? Can we spiritually mature together? You know, Jesus went through what he went through for one reason. We see it in Hebrews chapter 12. I'm just going to read the, the crux here. We do this by keeping, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he's seated at the place of honor on God's throne. This is why Jesus stayed in step with the, with the Lord. This is why he stayed in step with his Father. This is why he stayed in step with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because of you. You were the joy that was awaiting him. I just read about Paul being laid open. Here, here's why. Here's why Paul did it. 
2 Timothy 4, 5 and 8. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news. And fully carry out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have remained faithful. Now the prize awaits me, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Did you catch why he did it? It was really quick. It's in verse 6. I'm an offering to God. Paul didn't do it for the crown. He did it simply to be an offering to his Savior. So here's what I love to do for us today as we wind this down. Is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some questions. And you can bow your head if you want to. You can close your eyes. You, you don't have to if you don't want to. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to evaluate your life for just a few minutes here. Here's the first question. Are you satisfied with your life? That's a hard question sometimes because it's like, well, I'm satisfied with some parts of it. We're talking overall. Are you satisfied with your relationship with God? Are you satisfied with your level of spiritual maturity right now? Do you believe God has something for you that is bigger than what you're experiencing right now? Okay, do you believe you're on God's path for your life? Is there something you need to be doing besides reading and praying more to do a better job of following God's path for your life? What's the main thing that's keeping you from stepping into what God has for you? What's the one commitment you can make to God today that would get you to take that step or at least one step closer to taking that step? And here's the last question, and this is really the key. Jesus is asking you, do you trust me? Do you trust me? I'm going to post these on our social media this week so you can see this because I want you to think about these questions maybe even take some time and write down some responses and you're going to find that you might need to take some steps some steps and one of those steps might include reaching out to somebody to help you hey I felt like this is what the Lord said to me on Sunday I don't know how to do this can you help me okay that ball is in your court listen don't get chased down chase somebody down help me with this But I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I've talked for probably 35 minutes, 37 minutes today. God can say one word to change everything. So let me give him that opportunity right now. Father, right now, we we come before you in this moment. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to speak to your people. God, I'm not asking them to take steps. You are. You're asking them to take those steps along the path that you've called them to. So, Father, if you've revealed to any of them things that are keeping them from walking the path that you have for them, God, I pray that you'd give them, number one, the courage to recognize it, and number two, the boldness to speak up and ask somebody to help them. I pray they'd start right now by asking you, Holy Spirit, help me deal with this thing that's keeping me from walking the path that you have for me. And then lastly, Jesus, when it comes to trusting you. Of anybody to trust, you should be the easiest. But God, sometimes whenever we're trusting somebody and, and it seems so good, it's like we're, we're almost waiting for that moment where the rug's going to get pulled out from under us. God, help us see that there's no rug, that we can trust you, Jesus. Speak to your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. A lot of information today. I pray that you would internalize it. And I know some of you are on some paths right now and that you're, you're stressed about what to do and you're concerned. And I, I hear you. <laughs> Trust me. 
I have walked that road. I'm currently on that road right now. At least I'm not dealing with the stress like I was before, but definitely the Lord, you know, I want to be sure we're taking the right steps and doing the right things. I, I hear you. So let me tell you what we've done in, in terms of that. When we started to plant the church, the first thing we did is we got people around us that knew us, loved us, knew God, loved God, and had our best interests in mind. Those five things we always talk about. You know, know you, know God, love you, love God, have your best interests in mind. And we talked to them about what we felt like God was saying. And as that circle got broader and broader, we allowed people to speak into our lives to see if this is what should happen. Well, then miraculously, God started making things happen. Like I get a random phone call in April of 2019 from a pastor of a very large church in, in Dallas, that I, uh, just a friend of mine. And um, he said, hey, I heard you're going to plant a church. I said, that's what, that's what it looks like. Um, and he says, well, I'm, I'm going to send you $5,000 right now to get started. That'll cover all your legal fees and all that stuff to get the, it all incorporated. Wow, I didn't ask for that. Praise the Lord. You see, God will have what you need along the path. In this process with the building, what we're doing is we're pushing until we feel the door opens. And when the door opens, we walk through the door. We tried to walk through a door at the bypass. It was just the wrong door. It's okay. Here's what you do. Whoop, my bad. God wasn't sitting there going, I told you not that door. Okay? <laughs> Paths are hard. Christianity isn't always easy. But you have a team, you have a family. And some of that team is going to be here right now at the front. We're going to have our prayer team come up. And if you need prayer about what you're going through, what you're struggling with, this is your chance. This is your moment. Take the time to do it today, all right?